also. Uh, what? Bit close enough, are you? Shift the chair forward a bit, Coop. Shift the chair forward a bit. Welcome everybody to another video from Oscar Cooper. I hope you're all doing well. We've got PlayStation 4 turn-based games. This list was huge. I've been bolting onto it over time. Like, I've had it on my editorial lounge in, rather, for about two weeks. And I've had to add and add because I kept realizing that I've missed stuff out, misplaced stuff. It's a ranked list of turn-based combat games. Now, that needs to be important because, again, <laughs> I've, I've not included Civilization because I've realized that it's kind of really based on resources. Didn't even put it in my resources list, but it's really based on decisions, resources, culture. Do you know what? It's not, I want a raw turn-based combat list. Are you with me? Also not including turn-based JRPGs in the list. I know that's daft, but if you start thinking about that, you've got too much going on. So I've kept it to military Isometric, asymmetric, there's one exclusion to that rule. This list includes some brand new games, like literally came out a month ago, one of them, and this is pretty new. We're looking at Mechanicus, by the way. Sorry, I've spoken over half of the Mechanicus footage, and it is first on the list, and guttingly so, because I want to love this game. I think I will love this game. I just find it very hard. I struggle with its roguelike elements, and I'm having a lot of difficulty getting a nice smooth progression with it. I want things to be perfect with it, and so I keep going back and redoing missions and restarting stuff and I'm struggling with progression full stop because of my nitpickiness with making sure I do things really well. That might be part of the problem, that it punishes you for making smaller mistakes or losing particular members of your team. What I do love is its amazing bolt-on upgrade system with the Mechanicus themselves. If you don't know them, they've got these amazing limbs and AI add-ons and prosthetic crazy drills and stuff. They're a lot of fun to play with and a lot of fun to upgrade and sort of deal with between fights with the tech development and having them all on these little plinths and really just looking at them in massive detail. Now you may see part of my problem there is I've only scratched the surface with opening the different types of mechanics that are available to you. There's like a dreadnought one, there's these cool little sniper robot-y ones. So I'm annoyed that I'm not being able to get to this stuff because of this strange three mission system that it's got and this horrible brick wall that comes up on that annoying boss we have discussed this before and also this crazy pre-mission screen which is I don't know if it's grown on me or not just seems to add a sort of unnecessary amount of RNG before you go into a fight with these guys. So I try to strip it down. I don't want to go into all these rooms and kick over all these Necron tombstones by accident, thus increasing the force at which I've got resistance against it. Yeah, I don't like it, but I do love its 360 degree camera play and I do love its 40K elements and how well they have shown you the Necron, different Necrons, how difficult they are and how they just keep turning up halfway through a fight. It's, it's really cool to be fair. So first up was Warhammer 40k Mechanicus, available on the PlayStation 4, PC and Xbox, I think, probably not Switch, that, would, that wouldn't surprise me. Some of these games are actually available on Switch, I will tell you if they are or not, and some of these games have actually been captured not on a PlayStation 4, but are all available on the PlayStation 4, oh, you guys keep your eyes peeled to see if you can spot which ones, but crack on Coop, Jesus man. Cut deeper, deeper still, the answer hides. Buried in the flesh. Life unworthy of life feeds our inquiry. What we do is a mercy to the world. A mercy. Wanted to let that play a little bit because I bet some of you were like, what the hell is this? Other side, very new. This is one of the most recent purchased on the list. So it, it did it push me to think I need to find out where this stands with the rest of 
this genre on the consoles and good and bad news with it i the art style and music and stuff is is sublime and, and beautiful and it's a, an indie game it's not full cost and it, it pushes a few elements into the turn-based uh, strategy system one of them being heavy emphasis on rogue like elements particularly with your team so think about a roster think about upgrading individuals and adding cool buffs and stuff that you've earned through base game onto your characters and rebirthing them meaning it, it, there's permadeath with a particular character that is very interesting and it's a trait that plays probably through the whole way of this video is that some of these games offer permadeath and I love that and I don't like that it's handled really well here I love the differences in the sisters and the range one of them's got like a cool shield buff and the other one's just an out and out axe murderer it is very good aesthetically but what we're looking at here is kind of right this is harsh but it's kind of what you see is what you get with the entire game in regards to set pieces it does no more than what you're seeing here The timeline plays a big part in this. As you can see, the moves lined up at the bottom of the screen, left to right. There's delays, certain moves take a while to wind up and that also counts for the enemies as well so you get warning on a large move coming in and you can move quite a lot you get a lot of action points that you can spend on actually zipping around this map so you feel very mobile and you also feel very empowered because you've got range because you've got melee and because you've got defense but all found in different areas of your characters Last time I saw a cool left to right timeline like that was in Child of Light, actually. I'm counting that as a JRPG. Don't, don't, don't even start. We're not including it. Otherwise, we'll be here all day, Jesus. So why is it so far down in your list, Coop, if it's brand new and not doing much wrong? Well, it's just not doing enough new stuff for me. I love the idea of pumping your team down into the game and seeing who survives and, and upping who doesn't and rebirthing certain characters and carrying over traits to other dead ones. It's kind of all been done before, maybe not in the same place, maybe not in a turn-based game, but it's just not bowling me over with its innovation. It is bowling me over with its art style, though, and the, the map stuff with it not changing too much is kind of by the by when it comes to a turn-based combat game. You're not really paying that much attention to it. It's all about the combat, and it's all about the enemy and enemy design also, and their AI. All of this footage is going to be against AI, so I'm going to judge the games on that as well. This one's got a bit particularly ruthless AI and they're pretty damn scary as well. It's also mixing up the mission types quite well also, giving me a protection mission or even a countdown on getting out of an area or even just an out and out battle where I have to kill everybody. I like the idea of the objectives changing and I like the idea of it having a roguelike aspect on choosing what run you do. You can also choose the difficulty. You might want to do a challenging run to get all of those cool rewards for it. I revel in her strength. It's also nice and flashy with some outlandish special moves available. The girls getting buffs off each other when there's a kill happening. You, you see some sort of overflow when it comes to stats if you're doing really well. It's very clever. And I also love the idea of these enemies and the variety of them. And how freaky all the lore is with these like surgeons. There's some sort of weird shit going on with the storyline. It's typical Dark Souls not telling me anything stuff. So inside is not a failure at all could it have been a bit stronger yes is it a great modern turn-based combat game of course it is it's lovely and difficult and this is available on the switch also so lap that one up <laughs> dramas oh my god dramas you may have noticed that this has been put in after my honeymoon recording of Space Hulk Tactics to double check. No, I wasn't in some loved up lunatic asylum. Space Hulk Tactics is a little bit fu- Coop, you're ruining the list. You're telling them what's next. Coop, just, Coop, just see you clear going forward, mate. No one cares where you put these damn games. Or it's only you that seems to give a shit about what rank they're in. Let me know in the comments if I'm wrong. I know I'm not wrong. Banner Saga 2 in just after other side pretty low on the list i think if you ask me it's kind of scored a little bit low with me because it's got loads of story driven conversation and cutscenes, 
and decisions, right? You might know a game called Frostpunk at the moment, and of course, Civilization V as well. I don't like having to make really massive decisions that are based on stats and numbers I don't have time to read, and or conversations I may or may not have had with someone previously. Didn't, are you with me on that one? But to ignore a stunning turn-based combat game like the Banner Saga 1 or 2 or 3 would be in insane. It's got such a deep combat system and it's based in this amazing Nordic Viking cool sort of supernaturally but not um, projectile weapons and amazing spears and death animations and crazy enemies that are from no fathomable lore or background they probably are they're probably pictures of these on the sides of Stonehenge or something <laughs> As you can see, the combat field is really busy and we've got our classic left to right movement pain and there's so much choice when it comes to what you have access to in regards to an attack or a move and the variation in your different characters. Some of these characters are only ranged, they can't even melee attack, you need to make sure they're away from battle and some of them are massive tank-like damage dealers. It's very good and beautifully drawn. I think that was the first thing that sucked me in with this game was its art style was unignorable. I would see it go past on screenshots on IGN and I think, what is that game? And it was available on PC, the first one, for a long time before its popularity gained and the second one then got given to us on console. Not too sure where the third one's at, but um, it's definitely available on Steam. So. The Banner Saga is such a strong game on its combat and this story rich text adventure that comes with it, the idea of you traveling is a big draw. It's just not my cup of tea. I much prefer to have had streamlined combat only because I'm that complicated as a human being. You might be looking for that in an action, turn-based, real-time strategy game. That might be your draw, is the investment in the backstory and with all the characters. And this game offers that in droves. Like every character has got really incremental decision trees and development trees. The whole mechanics of the caravan itself and who's in charge and what's going on with the politics behind it all is really massive. It's even like distractingly so. I don't know if they've pushed on it more with the third installation, but I hope they haven't got rid of some of the best asymmetric turn-based combat on the systems. The Banner Saga 2, available PlayStation 4, available PC, not sure about the Switch guys. So this is one of the ones that got moved. This was right at the beginning before and I had to give it a number of playthroughs since the inception of the video to make double sure I really am putting it above Mechanicus and Inside. That's a big one and of course it's 40k so it wins me over there but this one's a little bit more personal and reminds me, I'm going to put a link in the description, Ollie Harper has just done a video of the history of Space Hulk games right back from the originals up to this one. So that's really interesting, have a look at that guys. But yeah, that kind of goes hand in hand with why I'm so celebratory of this title. It is what I wanted when I visualized a cool turn-based video game of Space Hulk. Totally what I wanted. I am That image in my mind, I've been carrying around for about 20 years. There'd been so many attempts at making a good version of the board game. A classic board game as well, it is so good. And one of the things it falls on is not really knowing what the map's gonna be and not really knowing what those gene stealers are gonna turn into. I also just look at the detail on the skulls on the first person view. I love the idea of it allowing you to zoom in, zoom out, be in first person, this is quite zoomed in this footage because I want you to see the model of the Terminators themselves, but it allows you to go out on a full combat version of the battlefield and it also allows you a 360 degree view of the battlefield, which is so important I think with turn based. When that camera's locked, I'm, I'm already annoyed, but this allows you so much freedom. But back to the point, I was a fan of this board game since I was a tiny child and this is so cool as a homage, as a final destination for how this game should look and be played on a, on a computer. Brilliant stuff.
plays on the roster thing really well with getting you to really care about your team and upgrading individual terminators and making sure that sergeant has a awesome axe and having all these amazing trinkets and different colored armors on your apothecary guys you know the deal and it's just so cool having your team watching them go up against these massively overpopulated gene stealer space hogs that's the theme with this game is that you overrun all the time it always was the theme there's so much going on and coming at you one hit is over the tension's brilliant and the ai is very good i'm playing this game on normal and i'm getting pushed and tested but not unfairly which is a Another thing I enjoy about it. It's got some modern tweaks with online versus mode. You can play as the Gene Stealers. It's also got a card system up in the top left there. You can actually use a card or convert it into action points. So you could at the last minute spend a couple of points on someone who's about to die, turn a whole turn around. Absolutely awesome this game. Definitely needs another look if you've not gone near it. Xbox, PlayStation 4, not the Switch unfortunately, but definitely PC also. Space Hulk Tactics. But wait, something different about this one. It matters not, brother sergeant. Seek and destroy. With Relic and Ritual, I've bent every effort towards the excavation and recovery of those long buried secrets. Exhausting what remained of our family fortune on swarthy workmen and sturdy shovels. At last, in the salt-soaked crags beneath the lowest foundations, we unearth that damnable portal of antediluvian evil. Okay, this is the one rule breaker. It's, it's not asymmetric but it is turn-based it's it's an indie game it's pretty old now i've got it on the vita on the crossplay and i've got it on steam and i've got it on the playstation 4 yeah this game is worth owning three times trust me now if i'm including this i had this dilemma last night then i should be including slay the spire right but now that's where i draw the line and slay the spire is a ridiculously addictive card-based weird roguelike if you haven't played it if I put it on this list, Jake, it would have just ruined everything. It would have imbalanced everything. So I've kept everything as asymmetric as I could. And this was the one that broke the rules. Darkest Dungeon. If you don't know about this game, if you've never played this game, this is the game that made the keyboard smashing up meme from that guy who, who died on the final boss with his final character. This is an amazing game. Annihilated. It is a roguelike. You do runs. Much like Insider, you have a team, a selected group, that you upgrade incrementally as you survive and go forward with them and if they die there is that permadeath and my god is it heartbreaking so you've probably noticed that a lot of my characters are only level one this is what i do i do runs with my b team try and get them up to speed take a few deep breaths and then try with my a team on my real side of the game and the tension man because of its RNG, which incidentally has had some tweaks lately, I'm pretty sure it has. I got quite far. I haven't played this game for about two months. I got quite far the other night. Like, I killed a boss far. Anyway, look at these rosters. This is each individual character's card. And look on the top right, you can see preferred position and preferred target. Such a deep setup with the four columns, putting the healer at the back. Suddenly they'll get moved by the enemies and they'll be thrown out of position. All their moves won't be available. There's trinkets on each character to upgrade. There's madness, right? That gets, you can just go mental and your character will ruin everything and cause huge problems. What a game and what an atmosphere. And the combat is just so white knuckle and raw. I was watching a developer's diary on it and all of the tweaks they had to do when it was in beta on Steam and the amount of stuff they've changed with it, especially with those dead bodies. So killing something can leave a corpse and that can interrupt you. I mean, get in your way, it can act as something that could ruin your setup because of these bodies are lying around taking up the space between you and the enemy the whole thing is very deep and some complained about mechanic but i didn't mind it that was all i knew so players of this game will know what i'm on about with that the campfire idea of halfway through a level sitting down getting buffs 
helping some of the people who have gone a bit crazy calm down a bit using different earn abilities to help bring your team back up to speed to complete the final part of the level is fantastic it's such a great idea some levels don't always require it but you feel really out on a limb when you've done your campaign and you're at the final stage or even when you get to a final boss which are handled fantastically and really act as a great crescendo to the end of each level. Beautifully drawn as well. The imagination behind the attacks and the enemies in this game is mind blowing. And that narrator in that dev diary they were talking about waiting until they got that narrator for the voiceover. So Darkest Dungeon, I think as an exception for not being asymmetric, definitely deserves to be on this list. With no living sinew to actuate them, Will these walking bones finally fail? Where's the XCOM? Where's the XCOM? <laughs> There's loads of randoms who are like, this guy's a lunatic. He's not put XCOM on yet. It's number two. There's only two games left. Blimey. Yeah. And if there isn't one hell of a box ticker for the old turn-based strategy combat game, it's got to be XCOM and XCOM 2. Played the original extensively on the PC 10, 15 years ago now. Brilliant. But it's also one of these, one of the biggest well-known permadeath games out there with the really snappy autosave on, which you'll soon find out the hard way how efficient that is. But XCOM 2, and I want to go on record as saying this, The Chosen uh, DLC, War, on the, War of the Chosen, wow. It's expensive as well. It's 35 quid, $35 actually. Maybe a bit less in pounds. But that goes, that's testament to tell you how much his content is in that. That's basically a sequel. It's basically XCOM 2.5. You know, it's huge and so recommended. No footage of it here because I'm lazy and I'm wanting to show you some of the basics of the game, which is buggering around with your team and doing all that research and get the resource management and team management in this game is unrivaled, completely unrivaled, it's massive. Obviously it's squad based and obviously it features some massive military hardware and it's got a big emphasis on fighting these aliens, getting the bodies and researching them and finding out what weapons they've got and then using them against the enemy. It's got some incredible and classic alien design. The feature for XCOM 2 is kind of like a space Nazis have taken over. The actually, you actually lost the battle on planet, spoilers, on planet Earth and now you're taking it back one kill at a time. Experimenting with loadouts is essential, positioning is essential, utilizing the overwatch mechanic is totally essential, developing all these cool gadgets and perks is a must, going out without health or without being able to deliver health to another team member is suicide, and of course there's that rank up with the promotion and all of the individuals having that darkest dungeon style stat that if they survive they get better and you invest more that's where the permadeath thing becomes so punishing is because XCOM 2's permadeath system is such a slam it's so horrible you have to go back so many times to your previous load from just making one daft mistake and I think that's one of its strengths is that you don't muck about with XCOM 2 it's straight down the middle there's none of this crazy magic sorcery any of that it's well the aliens have got some pretty weird shit going on but that all as mentioned gets passed over to you through the research and this is what we're looking at here you have a bunker or a building and it's your job job to expand all your research all your weapons recruit and just deal with all of the admin that goes behind <laughs> running an army which I don't mind one of the things I get annoyed about is that the time and having to it's time sensitive if you take ages or do loads of things on that map before going to a fight it can vastly affect things it's, so the campaign has got quite a lot of complication in and around timings and the whole game operating on a time-based day system with all of these games even though i haven't mentioned it that much is the decision making of the ai can make or break a good turn-based game it's really important and it takes you out of the immersion if the computer player starts walking in the wrong direction or just not killing you when it could have done that annoys me i feel like i've been 
given a sort of free pass. That never happens with this game. The AI is ruthlessly efficient, excellently programmed, and really makes you feel like you are actually fighting a killer alien tactical race. Countless observers attest to the existence of a much smaller, less intimidating variant of the sector. This is all fleshed out quite literally with different aliens having different technology almost embedded within them. And every time you reach a new level or kill something new, it's taken back and you research it and benefits are had from that. One of the things I haven't experimented with this game is online versus mode. I think that that would be incredible. I haven't had the balls to do it. Don't know anyone who owns the game to do it with on a friendly basis. I'm not hinting, but it's just, I think there would be a huge amount of depth there because I love the idea of having all of this background stuff stripped away to have a out and out bout with somebody else without all of this guilt and worry with your resources and whether you've got enough people to take back to the ship and all that stuff. So we're at number two, and we're going to say, let's say the entire XCOM series, particularly XCOM 2, and particularly War of the Chosen DLC. This has been available on the PC for about 25 years, available on the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. An incredible game and series. XCOM 2. Target's still up. Yes, of course. Regulars, we all know and love this game, don't we? Probably one of the best two-player split-screen pen and paper action RPGs out there. Also turn-based as well. And it's good for it to really flaunt its feathers in a list that's kind of really made for it. Division in Original Sin 2 has a fantastic prequel. The original blew my mind when it came out on the PlayStation 4 for sheer amount of content that it allows two people to access on a split screen at the same time. It is one of the few AAA games that allows you a flawless couch co-op experience. If you're a random, I'm Couch Coop and I do couch co-op videos and this is probably at the top of almost all of them. But wow, it's now at the top of my turn-based strategy games and rightly so it's good to have it on here and where it is and i think anybody who's into this genre and not gone near or played this you need to have a long hard think now because this game is massive and this is a this was a kickstarter this is a sequel to an almost perfect dungeon crawler slash arpg why are we still sat on this character selection screen because this is my this is my third playthrough of it and i went through and played john snow this time and it, and I was so taken aback at how different the decisions are and also what my interaction was like with the characters that I would normally play as. So my first playthrough was with the Lizard Prince and some of the integral story tangents that it that changed because he was present in game and not being played by me. Man, that is awesome. Nearly as awesome as putting a bucket on your head within the opening half an hour to go. I think it's easily got one of the best opening story intros of any modern game. I think the idea of being on that ship and turning up on that island and also interacting with everybody on the ship beforehand and the secrets on that ship and the background story that's revealed to you if it's your second playthrough and you know what to look out for. It's deep, really deep, and it's got a really deep element system as well. Stuff catching on fire and getting poisoned and getting oil doused on it and then poison on fire, oil in your eyes, it's all there. <laughs> We have our classic left to right move roster at the top of the screen this time. And we have a game that heavily emphasizes creating your own team on the fly. So this is one of the first other than other side that allows you to pick your team as you go. You find characters, you look for different people within villages that can join with you and they all have their own stats and never will you have the same roster on each playthrough of this game. It's because there's so many to choose from and you also get to choose their strengths just prior to them entering your team. 
it's pretty freaking mind blowing. Another thing that blew my mind was how pretty this game was and how refreshing it was to see uh, Fort Joy in all of its beautiful, tropical, amazing colors. And the game gives you a 360 degree camera and it gives you a zoom that's, that takes you right to the f eyeballs of your player and the detail on all of your little armor. Phew, I digress. So how do I pitch it to someone who's like an XCOM 2 fan and doesn't want or is remotely interested in sword and sorcery or a sort of period piece or whatever they would think this would be? This has got projectile, specials, magic, area effect, bombs, fire, crossbows, dragons. The creatures are endless in their variety. If you think of a game like Skyrim, the equipment system and the UI system on this is just as deep. You've got more infantry and more armor and weapon slots than you have on the majority of sword and sorcery ARPGs. It is a big hitter on that front. It's also a game that's huge on stats and numbers and buffs and knowing what you're doing and when to do it. So this is some of the zoom footage and, and by the way you can just flip to the character you want to play with the stroke of the L2 button which I thought was absolutely awesome. But that brings me back to Other Side. Other Side could have had a really redeeming feature where it allowed you to look quite closely at your characters or the monsters or that sort of thing. You might have had some small cosmetic change or have like a cool new weapon on and you can see that in game and see it in action. But it was locked, the visuals on that were locked, including the camera and the art style. With this, it's like a, it's like a beautiful painting canvas, like you're released on the creative front. And look at the size of the map as well. This brings me back to random encounters. This isn't a random encounter, but it felt like one because basically, because I wasn't playing as the prince, he had some assassin come up to him and try and kill him. And this bloke turned out to be hard as damn nails. And it's probably scripted, but it was really cool because I hadn't had it before at this stage of the game. Obviously didn't have it on my last playthrough. The prince nearly died. And the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I need to kill this guy because he's probably got some really good early game loot. So a battle ensued, a big one that went on for about 10, 15 minutes. If it wasn't for the fact that I'd played it safe with my team roster and put a healer on board and someone to resurrect the prince, I would have lost this fight and we would never have got that awesome loot. And it just got me thinking of how many different angles the campaign can take with events like this or with who you choose as your main character. It, it started me thinking, blimey, there's probably a story behind each of the character sets, well of course there is, but I didn't think they were this fleshed out and this interesting and exciting. I think a third one must be in the making. They made so much money off this. It, I remember it getting a very big multi-platform simultaneous release. Uh, the first one sat on PC for a long, long time before it got noticed as a great turn-based sword and sorcery ARPG. Yeah, that's a hell of a job description there. So we're gonna, finish up guys I wanted to say thank you very much if you're a random I do a lot of these lists go and subscribe or have a look at the others if you're a regular we're getting back to the old stuff don't worry I love to have a big list once in a while and I love to have a good couch card game at the top of the list man at the top did it